this. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. This is lesson 10, going through the 1689 crash course as we've been working through the um, confession. So we're making good progress here. We're gonna get all the way through um, chapter 16 um, this morning. So we're, we're moving um, right along in this study. I hope you guys have been growing and edified from this. I know um, for myself, it's just been an incredible refresher in these things. Um, and I just time and time again, I'm just grateful for the doctrinal clarity of this document. It's so um, uh, the wording is so obviously um, picked very particularly and concisely um, in a way that I think is just a real benefit. And so before we jump in, I just wanted to ask, I know I don't ask every week, but are any of you guys keeping up um, on some of the homework questions and looking over those before um, we, we gather? Has any of you been doing that? Yeah. And did you take anything away from this week and looking at these um, three chapters? I think you have some memory. <laughs> well, I, don't, I just kind of like you, I, I appreciate just getting it all so you can read it and, you know, it, it's, it's laid out. Right. I guess that's kind of what, you know, the questions make you yeah. look through it. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't want to think in particular. I like the way it's all very basic and it doesn't have a lot of flowery yeah. stuff going on. There, so. it, I really believe this confession is a great mixture of being robust and thorough. It's not simplistic, but it's also it's not a textbook either. You know, it, it's a concise yet also robust document all in one, which is hard to do. It's hard to have clarity and go into deep waters while also keeping it simple and not overly wordy. And that's a skill I don't necessarily have, but I appreciate that they had um, that skill in coming up with this. So let me go ahead and pray and we'll jump into the ones. Um, and, and like I said, um, I've said this at the beginning of the study, but I just continue to encourage it. Certainly the homework is not required. I hope you've seen that from these studies in any weeks you don't um, do the homework, you should be able to just jump right in. But it will, I think, help you get more out of it. If you've just already kind of been thinking over the topics we're discussing, um, it's not like starting from scratch when we come. So I'd encourage it, but um, if you don't do it, by all means, keep coming, um, and we're glad you're here. So let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the topics that we're getting into this morning, and really for the last um, number of weeks we've been considering um, the various intricacies of your work of salvation. And Lord, I just thank you so much that this confession spends so much time in careful detail, really going over the specifics of how your gospel works, what are the different parts of your gospel, and how your gospel is applied to us specifically, and what we are to do with this gospel, and how we are to live because of it. And Lord, I just thank you um, for each of these chapters and the various components of that that they've been touching on, um, and Lord, I just pray that as we get into these three chapters this morning, uh, that you would help my speech to be accurate. And Lord, I just pray for all of us as it's um, early in the morning, a lot of us are still adjusting to this time change. Um, God, I just pray that you'd help us to see what we need to see from your word and that we would grow in our love for you and what you've done. Um, but also that this wouldn't just be some sort of intellectual study, God, but th this would be growing our affections for you. This would be growing our desire to live for you and live in light of what you've done for us. And Lord, I just pray that this would be something that's a rich um, deposit for us spiritually, not merely some old document that we go over to feel smarter or any of those sorts of things. And so Lord, be with us, bless this time, do it all for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're jumping into three chapters this morning. The first is chapter 14 of Saving Faith. The second is chapter 15 of Repentance Unto Life and Salvation. And then chapter 16 of Good Works, okay? So we're jumping right into chapter 14 of Saving Faith. And if you're looking at your handout, looking at the outline, um, there's three main focuses with these three paragraphs. Uh, it's pretty basic outline for this one. And the first is the source of saving faith. The second is the act of saving faith. And the third is the distinctiveness of saving faith. So let's just jump right in. Opens by saying, the grace of faith. Notice that. I love that right at the beginning. I know we haven't gone very far. But what is faith? is a grace, is something, it's unmerited favor given to us by God. We talked a lot about grace last 
um, Sunday. But grace is the impetus of faith, the grace of faith, whereby the elect are enabled to believe. Notice this saving faith is not something that God like forces faith upon us unwillingly, but rather the grace of God enabling us, turning that hard heart into a soft heart, enabling us to respond in belief. So are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls is the work of the spirit of Christ. And this reference to the spirit of Christ is the same as the Holy Spirit, all right? And it's different language is used in the scriptures to talk about the Holy Spirit. And one of those is the spirit of Christ. Think of the Great Commission, um, where at the v- very end of it, he's, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's, that's a reference to the spirit of Christ, or the Holy Spirit that is with believers for the rest of their lives to the end of the age. All right, so work of the spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the word. How do most people come to saving faith? By the hearing of the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, right? And so that's a reference to that. It says, by which also, and by administration of baptism and the Lord's supper, prayer and other means appointed of God, it is increased and strengthened. To this point, so there's other things that will strengthen and bolster our faith, but the impetus of that faith is the word of God. So those, by, by being baptized or by taking the Lord's Supper or by praying, those aren't the things that grant us faith, but they do strengthen and bolster and grow our faith by doing those things, okay? And so going on, that is the source of saving faith, but what is the act of saving faith? Going into paragraph two, it says, by this faith, a Christian believeth to be true whatsoever is revealed in the word for the authority of God himself, and also apprehendeth an excellency therein above all other writings and all things in the world. All right, so if if God has granted you saving faith, he's going to grant you a love for the word of God and a belief in the word of God. It says, as it bears forth the glory of God in his attributes, the excellency of Christ in his nature and offices, and the power and fullness of the Holy Spirit in his workings and operations, and so is enabled to cast his soul upon the truth thus believed, all right, so that, that's a great line or phrase of what is faith, casting our souls upon the truth that is being proclaimed in God's word, okay? And also acteth differently upon that which each particular passage thereof containeth, yielding obedience to the commands, trembling at the threatenings, and embracing the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. But the principal act of saving faith have immediate relation to Christ, accepting, receiving, and resting upon him. What is that most important act of saving faith? It is in relation to Christ, accepting who Christ is, receiving who Christ is, and resting upon him alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. All right, this is that saving faith is the trust and belief in the word of God and particularly what it has spoken about salvation through Christ and Christ alone through his covenant of grace. All right, so this is the act of saving faith. And then thirdly, the distinctiveness of saving faith. It says this faith, although it be different in degrees, notice that, is everyone who has saving faith, do they have equal measures of that grace or of that faith? Well, no, it says it's different in degrees. Some people might have a really strong, robust faith. Other people might have a weak or a tender faith um, or an immature faith. It says, but different in degrees and may be weak or strong, yet it is in the least degree, so in its smallest form, of it different in the kind or nature of it, as is all other saving grace, from the faith and common grace of temporary believers. And therefore, though it may be many times assailed and weakened, yet it gets the victory, growing up in many to the attainment of full assurance through Christ, who is both author and finisher of our faith. What glorious truth proclaimed in the word. And here we see some careful clarity trying to distinguish between a genuine saving faith and a temporary faith 
that lasts for a little while and then is gone. This is what sign we've discussed a lot over the course of this study, but we see it again kind of hinted to that there's some that would seem to show faith and it's here for a moment and then, then gone and say, although they did have some sort of faith, it was not genuine saving faith um, that cast itself fully upon Christ. All right, and then going into chapter 15, incredibly helpful chapter within the confession of repentance unto life and salvation. And one of the things we, I think we got to grasp in chapter 15 is this, this confession wholly denies the sort of doctrine of easy believism. And that is that I can just intellectually assent to these truths, but have no genuine life change at all and genuinely be saved. All right, so we are saved by faith alone, but what does it say? It's not a faith that is alone. We've already talked about that in the confession, and we get into that doctrine more clearly, again, into chapter 15 here. So if you look at the outline, um, it's pretty much just broken down paragraph by paragraph, except the first two are dealing with the recipients of repentance, and then the third is the nature of repentance, the continuance of repentance in four, and the provision of repentance in five. So let's jump right in. It says, such of the elect as are convicted at riper years. That's another fun phrase that we don't use much anymore. Um, literally, this just means anything other than the early years, okay? So such elect as are converted, not in their early years, okay? So those that come to genuine um, faith in Christ and are converted later in life, all right? These are not those who have a testimony of, I've always grown up in knowing these truths and trusting in them. I don't remember the time that I came unto Christ, all right? So this is addressing people that don't fall into that category in paragraph one. It says, having sometime lived in the state of nature and therein served divers lust and pleasures, God in their effectual calling giveth them repentance unto life, all right? So this is a picture of what a lot of our testimonies are in living in a season of sin and ardent rebellion against God. And then God, by his grace, saves us at a later date. And I praise God for those testimonies. They're testimonies of God's grace and his mercy. And in many ways, we pray that our children don't have those testimonies, right? And that they would come to faith at a very early age and be spared from some of these things. But God saves both. And we praise God for that. So that's what the first is getting at. The second is getting at all believers generally. It says, whereas there is none that doth good and sinneth not, and the best of men may through the power and deceitfulness of their corruption dwelling in them with the prevalency of temptation fall into great sins and provocations. God hath in the covenant of grace mercifully provided that believers so sinning and falling be renewed through repentance unto salvation. Saying so whether they come to faith early in life or later at life, whatever it is, if they fall into even great serious sins, I love the language that's used, fall into great sins and provocations, okay? We're prone to believe that there are some unpardonable sins or some sins that God simply cannot forgive so great mighty sins and there certainly are when we think about consequences here in this life right if you murder someone that has great consequence if you commit adultery that's going to have great consequence here in this life but no matter how great or how serious the effect of that sin is there's not a single sin that before god's throne of mercy and grace if people will come in repentance can be renewed through repentance unto salvation all who repent and believe can come unto Christ for saving faith, no matter how grave a sin they've committed. This is not to mean there won't be earthly consequences for those sins. There often are. I mean, if you kill a bunch of people, God may save you and you will likely spend the rest of your life in prison, right? That, that's, you might even get the death penalty. That doesn't mean that God can't save you by his grace and mercy, but there are consequences. But we must realize that no matter how wicked the sin if someone comes to Christ with faith and repentance, Christ can save them, all right? There's no sin too great or provocation. Going into the third paragraph, it says, this saving repentance is an evangelical grace. Again, this is God's grace, whereby a person being by the Holy Spirit made sensible, all right? And this, I, I want to get in, this is a great 
um, paragraph here of really outlining what is biblical repentance. Often we'll talk about repentance as turning from our sin and trusting in Christ, but this lays out in some real doctrinal clarity what that actually looks like, all right? So it begins by saying the Holy Spirit makes one sensible to the wrong thing they've done, all right? So in other words, they've realized that what they've done is sinful, it's wrong, it goes against what God has spoken. The Holy Spirit made sensible of the manifold evils of his sin. That's where it begins. You recognize the thing that you did was wrong in God's eyes. And then it says, doth by faith in Christ humble himself for it with a godly sorrow. All right, so now that we see that what we've done is against God's holy law, God cultivates with us a humility and a sorrow over our sins, not re merely recognizing what we did was wrong, but having a humility and a sorrow over our sin. And then it says a detestation of it. Not only are we sad that we did it, but we hate that sin. We hate what we have done against a holy God. It says, and self-abhorrency. You know, Woe is me. How could I have done this? You know, we're afflicted within ourselves. There's inner turmoil because of it. But then the, it gets so sweet from here. It says, praying for pardon and strength of grace. Praying for pardon and strength of grace. God, even though I've done this horrible thing against you, even though I know this is bad, I hate that I've done it, Lord, would you forgive me by your grace and your mercy, coming to Christ for pardon and forgiveness of sin. Then with a purpose and endeavor by supplies of the Spirit to walk before God unto all well-pleasing in all things. In other words, now that we've come to his throne of mercy and grace, he's forgiven us of our sin, we seek to not do it anymore. We don't treat God's grace like a cosmic vending machine of like, oh, well, I'll just sin so I can, and I can apologize later and it'll be okay. That's not the way the Christian acts. We come, we bring it, we lay it on his altar of mercy and grace. He takes that, that sin, he takes it from us, and then we seek to turn from it and not do it anymore. And because of our indwelling sin, sometimes we do fall back into that sin again. And then we go back to his throne of mercy and grace and seek to actually be changed of it. We don't just live in the state of sin and just thinking I can just offer up some random prayers here and there for grace without any intent of changing our life. That's not genuine biblical repentance. Repentance is actually after we receive the grace and mercy of Christ, seeking to walk before God unto all well-pleasing in all things, as the confession says. All right, going on into um, paragraph four, the continuance of repentance. It says, as repentance is to be continued through the whole course of our lives. Note, we never graduate from repentance. Upon the account of the body of death, and the motions thereof, so it is every man's duty to repent of his particular known sins particularly. I love that phrasing at the end of there. What sins are we to uh, or repent of? Our particular known sins. I'll stop there. Sometimes we have this idea of repentance just being generic. Like, God, I know I've messed up. Forgive me for the things I've messed up in. But that's not what biblical repentance is. It's bringing our specific particular sins before him. God, I, I acted in anger and hatred in my heart towards this person. Lord, forgive that. Help me to love them as I ought. It's, it's a particular thing. Lord, I looked at something I should not have looked at. Lord, forgive me and help me to not look at that again, right? It's, we bring very particular sins before him and we do it particularly over and over again of those particular sins that we commit. If we're made aware of our sin, then we ought to bring that sin before his throne of mercy and grace. Now, I believe the grace of God covers us when we do not know the sins we've committed. Now, that's true in the Christian life. There are going to be sins you commit unintentionally that are never brought to your knowledge. And you'd say, well, I don't have the ability to repent of those. I think the blood of Jesus perfectly covers those. But as God makes us known and shines the light on our sin, in those moments, we must run to him for particular repentance. Okay, well, you're not going to be able to discern every sin you've ever committed. But as the light of God's word is shown and as his Holy Spirit and often as fellow believers in Christ are used by God to be that shining light. 
Okay, a lot of your particularly known sins will because a brother or sister in Christ loves you enough to make that particular sin known to you. All right, that's part of discipleship and life within the local church of us iron sharpening iron with one another. And as those sins are made known, we should repent of those sins particularly. And that is why in our preaching here, to the best of our ability, we don't just preach that man is kind of messed up and kind of fallen and kind of broken and has issues, and, and God can just make your life all better. No, we preach against particular sins. We call them by name, and that is a grace and a mercy in preaching, because guess what? Then they can repent of that particular sin and receive the grace and mercy of Christ. So we should not be afraid of calling sin what it is because that creates the opportunity for people to receive the actual healing from their sin by being able to repent and bring it to the Lord. Continuing on, the provision of repentance. Such is the provision which God hath made through Christ in the covenant of grace for the preservation of believers unto salvation, that although there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation, meaning any sin against a holy God deserves hell, yet there's no sin so great that it shall bring damnation on them that repent, which makes the constant preaching of repentance necessary. Again, we've already covered this, but there's no sin too great that God can't forgive through Christ when it is brought forward in repentance. There is no sense in which you can say, I sin too much for Jesus's grace. No, bring it to his throne of mercy and grace. Repent and believe the gospel. And any sin, particular sin you committed, no matter how wicked it is, God can certainly forgive it through Christ. All right, let's jump into good works here. I'll have to speed up a little bit, but repentance is certainly not a topic that you want to just gloss over um, as an incredible importance. There are a couple things I want to highlight here in the chapter on of good works, though. Begin in uh, paragraph one, the norm of good works. Good works are only such as God hath commanded in his holy word, and not such as without the warrant thereof are devised by men out of blind zeal or upon any pretense of good intentions. Who gets to define what good works are? God. And how do we know what he has defined what good works are? His holy word, okay? So that's where it starts. Paragraph two, the importance of good works. It says, these good works done in obedience to God's commands are the fruits and evidences, notice they're not the cause, but rather the fruit of a true and lively faith. And this is James, I will show you my faith by my works. And by them, believers, and then you think of this as like bullet points in a list, by them, believers, manifest their thankfulness to God, strengthen their assurance. Notice a lot of times we struggle with assurance because we have sins in our life or areas that we're not willing to surrender to Jesus's lordship. Your assurance can grow by your willingness to come under the law of the Lord. That's a wonderful gift of our good works. It says they edify their brethren. They adorn the profession of the gospel. They stop the mouths of the adversaries. It's a wonderful witness when we do good works. They glorify God whose workmanship they are, created in Christ Jesus, thereunto that having their fruit unto holiness, they may have their end eternal life. There's glorious fruits from following what God has commanded for us as those who are walking in the free gift of redemption in Christ's blood, transformed by him, made alive, and then we live in light of what he's done for us. But it's not mere obedience out of necessity. There's great fruit that comes in the Christian life if we would follow what his word has said for us, all right? So there's the importance of good works. And then, but what's the cause of our good works? We see that in paragraph three. It says their ability to do good works is not at all of themselves, but wholly from the spirit of Christ or from the Holy Spirit. And this, again, I'll point back to what is the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. All right, that's good works, right? For lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. How are we to do those things that Christ has commanded us through the empowering of the spirit of Christ that dwells in us to the end of the age. 
goes on to say, and that they may be established or enabled thereunto, besides the graces they have already received, there is necessary an actual influence of the same Holy Spirit to work in them. And notice almost all of these are just direct quotes from the New Testament, to will and to do his good pleasure. Yet they are not hereupon to grow negligent, as if they were not bound to perform any duty, unless upon a special motion of the Spirit, but they ought to be diligent in stirring up the grace of God that is in them. All right, and then going into paragraphs four and five, we see the limitations of good works, all right? And first we see the works of super irrigation are impossible, all right? They who in their obedience attain to the greatest height which is possible in this life, so those who obey the word as good as anyone possibly could, are so far from being able to super irrigate and to do more than God requires let me stop there. Does anyone know what super arrogate means? It's a big word for early in the morning. A good translation of it would be to re merit reward by going beyond duty. To merit reward by going beyond duty. And what this is getting at is these reformers were addressing w one of the doctrines within the Catholic Church that the saints th were those who had gone above and beyond the good works of a normal person. And thus they had like extra good works that they could impart to others because they did enough good works for themselves and plus a bonus amount of good works that they could also impart to others. All right, that sounds kind of crazy, but that was the Catholic doctrine. And so they're very particularly saying that is not the way good works work, okay? So they were intentionally calling out that error in this and to do more than God requires as that they may, or they fall short of much, which is duty, and they are bound to do. All right, so no one exceeds over and above, because we fall short of even what is our duty to do, as required as being God's creation. Going on into a similar, works to merit are impossible in, in paragraph five. It says, we cannot by our best works merit pardon of sin or eternal life at the hand of God. Do you know that? Your good works cannot merit your pardon before God. You cannot earn your salvation and cleansing through your good works before God. It's not possible. It says, by reason of the great disproportion that is between them and the glory to come, and the infinite distance that is between us and God, whom by them we can neither profit nor satisfy the debt of our former sins. We can't do enough good to cover the debt of our former sins. It says, but when we have done all we can, we have done but our duty. In other words, we have an obligation to follow God based on being his creation. We, we got to this idea of duty earlier in the confession, but that's merely our duty. That doesn't merit us salvation before him. It's simply us doing what we ought to be doing. And it says, and our unprofitable servants, and because as they are good that they proceed from the Spirit, in other words, and guess what? If you are actually doing something good, it comes from the Spirit and not even from you. It says, and as they are wrought by us, they are defiled and mixed with so much weakness and imperfection that they cannot endure the severity of God's punishment. Meaning even when we do good things, it's to God's credit because it's the Holy Spirit working in us. But even that is mixed with our own error and it's not even perfect when we are doing good things because we have things in our heart or things in our actions that you know, are maybe in the right direction but still not perfect because of our indwelling sin. That none of these things can undo the severity of God's punishment. We can't work our way out of the debt of our sin is what this paragraph is getting at. But then getting into the final two paragraphs, the acceptance of good works, beginning in paragraph six, we see the good works of believers. It says, yet notwithstanding, the persons of believers being accepted through Christ, who did all the good work, amen, it says their good works also are accepted in him. Our good works are accepted because we are ultimately accepted in the good work of Christ on our behalf says, not as though they were in this life wholly unblameable or unreprovable in God's sight. We know that they still have error, but that he looking upon them in his son 
is pleased to accept and reward that which is sincere, although accompanied with many weaknesses and imperfections. I think a great picture of this is of children, okay? So we have a bunch of small children in our home, and often we'll ask them to do chores around the house, right? To clean up the toy room or to make their bed. And now, as I go into the toy room after the kids have cleaned up their disaster of toys, and they've genuinely worked hard to clean it up, but things are in the wrong bins, and maybe a blanket is folded terribly and just kind of thrown over here, I can genuinely accept that, hey, they worked hard to clean up this disaster of a room, right? I appreciate that they sought to obey their father. They did what they were told. They weren't downstairs bickering doing it. But let's be honest, if I cleaned up the toy room, would it look better? Yeah, of course it would. Would things be in the right place and not, you know, disheveled like they are? Yeah, but I can appreciate, hey, they did what their father asked them to do. They tried. And it, that's honoring to their father, right? I appreciate the work they did. Same if I ask a child to make their bed, is it going to be perfectly crisp and uniform and in all ways every single time? No, but if they gladly just go and make their bed and do what they're told, I appreciate that as their father, right? So as it is with God, he appreciates the works that we do unto him. He knows they're imperfect, right? He's not unaware of the fact that our good works unto him aren't without error. But when they're done in faith and love and obedience to the Father, they are genuinely honoring to him because we are his adopted children. And he has a fatherly affection for us. And children, obey your parents in the Lord, and it will go well with you. You will live long in the land, all right? He appreciates our efforts of obedience, even when they're mixed with error. All right, getting into the final paragraph, the good works of unregenerate men. And this is a question I think people often wrestle with when we're talking about the, the serious nature of indwelling sin and the serious nature of the corruption of sin. They say, but don't, don't unbelievers still do good things? Well, listen to what this says. It says, works done by unregenerate men, although for the matter of them, they may be things which God commands. Did you know that, that unbelievers can do things that God commands? They absolutely can. Do, do unbelievers tell the truth sometimes? Yeah, of course they do. Do they honor their father and mother sometimes? Yeah. So they, they can do things that God commands of them. And it says, and of good use, both to themselves and to others. Will it go well for them if they live according to God's commands? Yeah. The person who spends their life not stealing and not lying and not committing adultery, even if they're unbeliever, is the fact that they didn't steal and didn't lie and didn't commit adultery going to be profitable for them in this life? Certainly it is, right? Those things have earthly consequences. And so it's of good use both to themselves and to others. If I'm buying or conducting business with someone who's an unbeliever, I sure hope they're being honest with me in that business dealing, right? It's good for both of us. It says, yet, because they proceed not from a heart purified by faith, nor are they done in a right manner according to the word. In other words, their acts of obedience aren't in faith unto God. They're not to bring God glory, nor to the right end, the glory of God. They are therefore sinful and cannot please God, nor make a man meet to receive grace from God. And yet their neglect of them is more sinful and displeasing to God. So one of the things I've heard from, we've, we've had Christian friends that have expressed this sort of thing before, is it, what, what difference does it make if it's, someone's an unbeliever whether they follow God's word or not? What difference is it? Why even, why even ask them or expect them to have any sort of obedience? And we get at it at the very end of this, that yet their neglect of them, this is speaking of the good works, is more sinful and displeasing to God, that there's this idea of, in, in the scripture of heaping more and more wrath upon yourself in your rebellion. And we should want to spare people from that, right? We, we don't, it's, it's never a good thing to rebel against a holy God. Now we understand that unless they come through the narrow gate of Christ, they will not be saved, but we shouldn't delight in anyone sinning for any purpose. And, and we understand that those good works are not meritorious of salvation, but there's real consequences as we live in the world in rebellion to God's good standards. And that's why even when we think about like the laws in our, our land, we should advocate 
for things consistent with what God's word has spoken. Does that mean that everyone in the country is going to be a born again believer? No, it doesn't mean that. But will it go well for our country and for our neighbor if they live in accordance with these things? Yeah, there's profit to following what God has spoken. Just as the simplest example I can give to this, I always go back to adultery, right? Unbelievers can marry. That's part of God's common grace, right? That is certainly something he's given to them. There's no reason why two unbelievers shouldn't get married, all right? But yet, if they go on committing a bunch of adultery, will that go well for their marriage? No, it won't. Their marriage will be better, even if not meritorious for salvation, if they don't cheat on each other, right? It seems pretty obvious, but that's true of all of God's laws. We're living in God's world. If we live according to his rules, it will go better for us. Right? Now, none of this is it saying that these things are meritorious to salvation. I think the paragraph is very clear. But we should see that there's a reaping and sowing principle in this life, and that believers, in as much as they're by outward actions conforming to these laws, that is, go better for them in this life, although not ultimate unto salvation, and as much as they rebel against it, they're heaping upon more of God's displeasure and wrath in the day of judgment. We certainly don't want that for anyone. And so I hope this is helpful. We've walked through these three chapters. I went a little long, but I, didn't, I wanted to flesh out some of these principles. And so we, we do still have just a few minutes for questions, though, if anyone has questions in light of these three chapters on faith, repentance, and good works. Crickets. Was there anything that particularly stood out to you guys or wording within these three chapters that you found helpful or clarifying? Uh, two statements were good uh, from someone taking in remembrance, uh, even for uh, sharing faith is um, fight. First paragraph, uh, chapter 14, hmm. uh, the grace of faith whereby the elect are enabled to believe yeah. to the saving of their soul is the spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the word. Yeah. I think that's kind of cool because it also goes and it talks a little bit more about uh, chapter 16 when you're talking about good works. And yeah, we may do something um, and maybe we genuinely believe we're doing it for the, you know, the benefit of the gospel. But all honestly, yeah, we do have our own little uh, motivation yeah. uh, thing in, in the background, which whatever that is. So it, it is the grace of faith. We were able to believe. And I think that's even, even more touching, you know, that you pick uh, to receive that type of grace. Uh, and, and to be given that type of faith because we don't know how horrible uh, of where you know, a penalty, you know, death and hell is. Yeah. So. It's good stuff. I know for me in these three chapters, the one that really particularly stuck out to me as being helpful was the second paragraph of chapter 16, um, particularly kind of that list that's given in this like second, third, fourth line where it says, um, and by them, believers manifest their thankfulness, strengthen their assurance, edify their brethren, adorn the profession of the gospel, stop the mouths of adversaries, and glorify God whose workmanship they are. What a, what a great declaration of when uh, all the, the fruits and the joys and the intentions behind um, why we seek to obey um, the Lord. None of those are meritorious for our salvation. None of those are out of you know, guilt ridden obedience none of those are done even you know out of fear but rather out of thankfulness it's strengthening our assurance it's edifying the brothers and sisters in christ it's adorning the profession of the gospel it's stopping the mouths of our adversaries and it's glorifying gods who has made us his workmanship i just think that's such a glorious um, phrasing um, in that little section of the confession that is so helpful in motivating our Christian obedience, because so often we're motivated by guilt, we're motivated by fear and insecurity. We talked about this 
on our men's study a little bit, but rather the joy of the Lord is our strength. Those are the things that ought to be motivating our labors in the Lord. Um, and I, I just think this is um, really helpful in that. So I'm going to go ahead and pray. If you have more questions, certainly we, we can talk. Uh, but let me land the plan here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the grace and the kindness of the gospel and that you lead us into saving faith as part of your grace unto us. And your grace unto us also leads us in repentance. And your grace working through the Spirit of Christ leads us unto good works. Lord, this is all for your glory and not our own. So Lord, I pray that we would be diligent in these things. We would seek to place our faith in act of obedience to you. That our, we would show others, we would adorn the gospel, we would show others our faith by our works. And that as we sin, we would realize that we can come boldly and confidently to your throne of mercy and grace, run to you in repentance, turn from our sin, knowing that we are already forgiven in Christ. Um, and Lord, that we wouldn't have our assurance um, challenged by that, um, by not being willing to take our sins to you. And so, Lord, I pray um, just even as we are talking about repentance and the necessity to repent of specific sins specifically, Lord, I just pray that if there's anyone in here who is burdened by a very specific sin, that they would bring that to your throne of mercy and grace, that maybe they'd tell a brother or sister in Christ this morning for accountability, but then they would turn gladly in repentance, knowing that it's forgiven in Christ. They can run from that, receive your grace of forgiveness, and move on and not be burdened, but rather receive the pardon that comes through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I just pray that if there's anyone in here burdened by that, that they'd bring that before your throne confidently this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.